All right. Well, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I certainly wondered what the adults meant when they said, God is with us. Well, of course, I believed in God. I prayed. I trusted he would take care of me, but I wasn't sure what God is with us meant. Not until I was, oh, maybe six or seven. So at that age, I used to need to have my dad to be there, to sit by my bed and put his arm over me so that I could get to sleep. But there was a little problem with that. My dad, three nights a week, worked during the night. So he wasn't there to help me get to sleep. So he told me I should tell God about it. So I prayed to God about it, and I told him how I felt not having my dad there. And you know what? As soon as I prayed that, I felt like my dad's arm was around me, but nobody was there. It was God that went and put his arm around me, and it helped me get to sleep. And it wasn't just one time. Every time Dad was at work and I needed help sleeping, I would pray that prayer again. And there again was God's arm around me. Well, as I got older, I got to where I didn't feel so much like I needed help going to sleep. So I didn't pray it as often. But I still could remember it. But my life started getting pretty hard in high school. In my four years in high school, I had five people in my family die. And then when I went to college, I was feeling sick all the time. And for a long time, the doctors didn't know why I was feeling sick. And then on top of that, I was going to college in another state, away from my family. So things were kind of rough for me. And I started having a hard time sleeping again. And I remember I called up my dad and talked to him about it. And he told me well, he wished he could do something for me, but he was like five hours away. So he told me to pray again, and so I did. And you know, just like when I was a kid, I felt God's arm around me again, and I was able to rest easy. Everything bothering me just went away. And I finally think I understood then what it meant when God is with us. It meant he really is there to take care of us. I just had to ask him and believe that he would do it. And you know, he'll do stuff like that for you too if you need it. When you tell him how you're feeling, He'll take care of you. He cares about you. And he really is with us. You know what? As I was thinking and praying about what I wanted to share with you guys today, since I had the prayer, the Lord impressed on me that at this time, as we're preparing, even though it's November here, we're pre preparing for Christmas, he told me, he said, what gift are you going to give me this year? And you know, I was shocked. I thought, wow, you're right, Lord. We think of everybody else, but we forget to give God the present. You know, the wise men came, and they, he brought, they gave, brought gold and frankincense and myrrh. But you know, Jesus is not asking us to bring us that. He's asking us to bring us. Give him us. Give him us. This little gift. I mean, you know, he gives us so much, but we give so little. So this year, you know, as we think about giving him what we can drop in our box, you know, Put a box under the tree. Put things that you want to give Jesus this year. If it's your heart, put a heart in there. If it's your troubles, put a troubles in there. If it's your family, put pictures in there. But put pictures in the box and wrap a box up for Jesus. Put a worship book in there. You know, it's your time you spend with him that is so valuable. That's what he wants is your time. And you know, my daughter, uh, one of my daughters does not have a lot of time. You know, it seems like you're rushed going to work in the morning. And so, you know what she's done? She's put her worship book in her car. And as she goes there, before she goes into work, she has those few minutes with him right then. You know, that's a wonderful idea. I have, I have my worship now, time in the morning, and nothing's going to stop that. And that's the time that God can speak to me because that's so important.
I'm going to leave this little box here. So I hope you guys do that. But let's pray, Lord. Oh, Lord, you ask so little of us, just us, just the time to spend. May we remember that and reflect on it as we come into these holiday days. Think I, you know, I also want to pray for those that are in the bulletin. Oh, my goodness. Pray for Angie Carey's mom, Tina, who's been missing for six weeks. What? Yeah. That is a terrible. I can't imagine. And Leon, Leanna Lenore, who's passing away, give her strength, Lord. Give her a future that she can see heaven that will be there. And pray for Phyllis Simmons and May, Maisie Bunker's sister and daughter who has a long battle with cancer. Lord, these are hurt things that hurt our families. Lord, bless this church as we go all in. May we be all in for you, Lord. You are everything. We need to put you top priority. This church is here for a reason, Lord. Direct us what we should be doing for you, Lord. We pray all this in thy precious name. Amen. You know, I would just like to uh, add a word of prayer before we start our message here today. Um, this, is, this is kind of a hiatus from uh, ancient words. We're going to do some more of these in the future. Um, but uh, with, the, with the events that are coming up, we're going to take a little hiatus. But um, today's message is, is, a, is a really important one. It, it really struck my heart when I first learned about it. And I, I want to share something really important with you today. So as we, um, as we begin this message, I invite you to bow your heads with me in an additional word of prayer. Abba Father, you are the author of, of your word that you gave to us and that the word came and dwelt among us and that, that he showed us not only how the word is lived, but um, how the word changes us. So I pray, Father, in a special way that you would just anoint this time. Um, we know that your Holy Spirit is always with us, but we just ask for an extra, an extra impression and guidance from, from your spirit. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You know, as a <clears throat> grandfather, I can certainly relate to this. A grandfather was concerned about the direction that his, uh, that his grandson was taking. Maybe grandmas feel that way too. Parents, you know. And um, so the grandfather was sitting down with his high school age grandson and he's talking with him and um, he says, um, son, what, what is it that you want to do with your life? What, what comes next for you? And he says, well, I want to get a job. And he says, that's great. And then what? And uh, then the grandson said, well, then I want to buy a car. And he says, wonderful, and then what? And, um, and he says, well, um, I, I, want to, I want to find a wife. He says, okay, and then what? And then he says, well, then I'd buy a house. And he says, okay, and then what? Well, then we'd have a family. And, and he says, and then what? Well, he said, um, well, I'd probably retire and do some traveling. Uh, and then what? Well, he says, well, I guess I'd get old. And, and he says, and then what? Well, I guess I'd die. And the grandfather says, and then what? You know, that topic is, uh, is an important one for us because we are people that have eternity hardwired in us, you know? It doesn't matter whether you believe or not. When, when death comes, it ha it's, this, it's this interruption of our sensibilities because we are not wired for death. We are wired for eternity. And the question of what happens when we die is a very important one. Now, when I, when I first started learning something about this, um, the, you know, the, someone quoted to me, they said, well, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 
And kind of what they were intimating is that when you die, you're immediately with, with the Lord. And I, I thought, okay, well, that, that makes sense. And, and I, I looked up that text, and it comes from um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to be kind of looking in there today. And um, the actual text that, that, uh, that they were quoting from is, Therefore, we are confident, now Paul is writing this he's, as he's inspired, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And then in verse 8 it says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present from the Lord. So, okay, well, that, that seemed to make sense. But one of the things about the ancient words is you need to read the whole context, right? We need to read before and after and understand what's going on. Who's listening to this? Who's the audience that, is, that this is being presented to? Um, what are the cultural conditions of that time? Were there, were there special meanings in some of these words? And so as we study in the ancient words, um, sometimes we get a first impression, but as we study more, there's more that comes out of it. So, um, looking along, it, let's look at the fuller context of this. And in uh, verse 1 we read, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Well, that's good. That's reassuring. That first verse tells us that we have a place when, when, when we leave this earthly tent that we have a place in, in heaven, a city that's built by, uh, not built by human hands, it's some, something that God has prepared for us, right? So we, we continue on, and um, now in verse 5 it says, Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. So again, talking about the earthly tent, while we're here on earth, God has given us this incredible gift that Jesus promised to us, the helper, the paraclete, the one who would come and teach us and bring things to memory and convict us of sin and help to guide us through and prepare us for this eternity. And he is a guarantee of our future in heaven. So God gives us this incredible gift of the Holy Spirit. And, and even in reading the Word of God, it says that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. The same Holy Spirit that empire, inspired people to write the Word of God, that same Holy Spirit helps us to understand the meaning of the Word of God. Very, very important. So when, when you're studying the Bible, it's, it's good to ask the Holy Spirit to give you understanding because there's, there's oftentimes more than face value to dig for, deeper. So the Holy Spirit is our guarantee. It is that down payment from God. It is that, that presence with us that helps us to have that assurance of eternal life that the Spirit of Christ speaks into our heart and brings us to that place where we can call Jesus Lord and Savior and accept his forgiveness and have that guarantee of eternal life. You know, people go through life and, and they, they are insecure about that guarantee. They oftentimes are, 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 are troubled by that unknowing. But here it says a guarantee. Well, if it's guaranteed by the creator of the universe, that's a pretty good guarantee. I think we can, I think we can trust that. So we continue on in our study here. And in, in verse 9 and 10, it says, So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So while we're in this earthly tent, while we're in this body, you know, what we do matters. But don't forget about the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit that is developing in us a trust and a love for God that that does changes on the inside. Literally, there are scriptures that, like, for God, it is God who 
works in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure from Philippians, that it, it says that God is literally rewiring our minds as we study God's word. As, as we behold him, we become changed in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So, so God, that guarantee of the Holy Spirit, is literally transforming the way we see things in the world. And, in, and when we see things differently, we respond differently because we're broken people. And as God begins to put us back together from all of the stuff that is broken in us and sin that, that is within us, God begins to help us to see the world in a new way so that we can respond in a new way. I'm grateful for that. See, because the Holy Spirit is that guarantee that the things we do, well, the greatest picture is when Jesus says the judgment would be like this, the sheep and the goats. You know, the sheep are on his right hand, the goats are on his left. And, and the ones on his right hand say, Lord, when did we see you in prison and visit you? When did we see you naked and clothe you? When did we see you hungry and feed you? They, didn't even, they weren't even aware that they were doing this for Christ because they had been fundamentally changed in their relationship, and it was becoming who they were. That's a good guarantee, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's what God has done for us. He who began a good work in you will see it to completion, right? God has given us this guarantee. He begins a good work in us. He will see it to completion. Our whole job is just to to focus on him and to, to learn to love him and trust him while he changes us. Oftentimes we get into religion. I hate religion. Religion tells me that I've got to behave in a certain way for God to love me, that I've got to go through and jump through different hoops in order for God to say, okay, you're acceptable. I oftentimes remember a boss that I worked for, I could never please him. No matter how hard I worked, no matter what I did, he always found fault with what I did. And if I did something right, he would, he would say, yeah, but what about that time? You remember that time? You know? I, I worked so hard to try to please that guy. Finally, I got worn out, and I, I, I couldn't, I, you know, the more I tried, the more mistakes I made. I got worn out working for that guy. I, I don't even remember his name, but he was a real guy, you know. We probably have those guys in our past, you know. And, and I worked for another guy who, who really cared for me. He was the first, his name was Charlie Johnson. I remember his name. He, he was the first one that was willing to take a chance on me, and, and he gave me the luxury of failure and helped me to look beyond that and to do better the next time. I knew that he had my back. I remember in a board meeting where the long knives were out and I was the main meal. And, <laughs> and he, was a, he, were, he was a retired lieutenant commander in the, in the Navy. He flew, uh, flew in World War II and all six foot four of them stood up at the head of that table and he put his hands on the table and he spoke Navy. And he said, okay, <laughs> I don't want to hear any more of that bloop. How are we going to fix this, and how are we going to prevent it in the future? And he put, his, he put his reputation on the line for me. He spent capital for me. <laughs> I remember him. He's one of the great heroes of my life. And I came to realize that God is not a God who is setting up obstacles to see the survival of the fittest and only the best and purest can get into heaven. God is a God who is removing obstacles because he, he came into the world that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the God I serve. That's the God I love. That's the God I'm learning to trust more and more with my present circumstances because he's removing obstacles. He is making ways for me to experience success. That's the God I love. The God who has given me this guarantee that I can have security, that he, when he says, whenever anyone confesses their sin, is, he is faithful and just to forgive his sin and to wash away most of his unrighteousness. All of his wrong. Yeah, that's right. That's an important word, isn't it? All is all. Yeah. What a mighty God.
So we continue on in this study. I was nearly convinced, but there were two, there were two uh, phrases in here that got me confused. It was in verses 2 through 4. And, and there, there we read this, this, uh, this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And it says, Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. So, in other words, Paul is saying, I, I, I would love to be clothed in my heavenly dwelling to, to be in the presence of God, right? I, I, I long for that. Life is hard. It couldn't happen too soon that I can be in the presence of the Lord. But then, then he continues on and he, and he introduces a word here in verse 3 that kind of got me confused. He says, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. Well, so we're either clothed on earth or we're clothed in heaven. But what's naked? There's something in between. There's a naked state. And then, then we read it um, in, the, in the next passage, and it says, For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. And so here's this unclothed state, this naked state. What is that? It's something in between. I'm either clothed in life on the earth or I'm clothed in heaven, but I have a naked state somewhere between. So what is this naked state? So I, um, I'd, I'd like to introduce a thought about Lazarus. Now, Lazarus was a good friend of Jesus. He lived in Bethany. His sisters, Mary and Martha, were there. And when Jesus came down to Jerusalem, he lived... He lived with them in Bethany. He, it was a safe house for him. It was a place where he could relax and rest. And they, they were loved. And, and so Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus, who was in a remote place, that Lazarus was sick. And Jesus, Jesus delayed. You know, and, and one of the mo most awesome parts of the story is, you know, Sometimes we pray and we send word to Jesus and they say, we need you now. And we don't seem to get an answer to prayer. But it's because God has something much bigger in mind for us. So Jesus says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. And his disciples replied, hey, that's great, because if he sleeps, he's going to get better. He's getting rest. You know, the fever must be broken. And he's going to get better. And then in verse 13, Jesus uh, had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought that he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So I, I'm wondering, is this naked state death? Is it in the, when we're in the grave? Is that the in-between place that Jesus is talking about? And he says he's going there to wake, wake him up. Well, there are some ancient words that we, can, uh, that we can look at here. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5, we read, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even their name is forgotten. So in this world, you know, over time, they're forgotten. They have no thoughts. There's no consciousness. And, and I think of sleep, you know. Um, I used to be able to sleep a lot better when I was a little kid. But, but there are still those nights where I fall asleep. I don't remember a dream. I don't remember anything. Eight hours can pass. I have no consciousness. So the, the last thought I had when I'm falling asleep... And the first thought that I have when I wake up is like eight hours between, but there is nothing between that I can remember. All I know is my first thought when I wake up, my last thought when I fell asleep. Well, if we project that into thousands of years, that's kind of an interesting thing, isn't it? Well, we continue on. There's a, there are some more. Isaiah chapter uh, 38, verse 18, we read this. For the grave cannot praise you, death cannot sing your praise. Those who go down into the pit cannot hope for your faithfulness. So in other words, again, we're not up in heaven praising God when we die. We're in the grave, unconscious, 
waiting, but not even knowing we're waiting. <laughs> In Acts chapter 13, verse 36 and 37, we read this. Now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation. He fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors, and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. That's Jesus, right? But David was still in the grave. His body decayed, and he wasn't, he wasn't conscious. So if death is like a sleep, as Jesus called it, raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus called waking him up the resurrection, he raised him up. So what does that look like? Well, the Apostle Paul, who also wrote this passage that we're talking about in 1 Corinthians, was inspired, and he, he wrote to the Thessalonians a very familiar verse. He says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Those who are sleeping will rise first. So this is when it happens. This is when we go from a naked state to a clothed state again, right? And it continues on. After that, we who are still alive, oh, there are going to be people still alive who are followers of Jesus. And, and so we have both. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. You know, I love that message. Because that is an encouragement for us. Knowing, knowing this gives us hope. Um, when, one, of the, one of my favorite word couplets comes from Jeremiah 29, um, where it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to give you hope and a future. You realize those two words are like inseparable. Without hope there is no future. Without a future there is no hope. You know, we have a hope. Some call it the blessed hope. It's in the, it's in the scriptures, calls it a, the, the, the blessed hope. We have a hope because we have a future. And that future is guaranteed to us. So Paul says that there's going to be a, a very visible, powerful appearance of the Lord in the air, and we go up to meet him in the air. And the dead in Christ will rise first. But that's not all. There's still more. So... Why does death being like a sleep make perfect sense to me? And uh, here, here's one great reason that I found in the scriptures. You know, I, I've done Bible studies with spouses who have lost their lifelong partner. They, they talk almost, you know, they, they were together for 30, 40, 50 years. And they said, you know, we used to do everything together. I, I remember that, you know, they, they would go shopping for clothes together, you know, and they, they would do all these different activities together, and they just loved being together, and then death has separated them. One had fallen asleep. And, 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 and this, is, this is what I love about this next passage. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 10, we read this. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Verse 9, by faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. Oh, wait a minute. The land that God gave him, the, the, the inheritance in, on the physical earth, he felt like a, a foreigner? He felt like a stranger in that land? So what's going on here? And, and, and uh, continues on, he lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. So he was looking for this, this city unbuilt, un, unbuilt by human hands. You remember from our first passage in, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians that we were looking at. And then what happens? talks about all these people who lived by faith. And then in verses 39 and 40, we read this. Oops. There. In verses 39 and 40, we read this. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Now, Paul is writing this. Um, my, I, my preferred 
version, and there, there are different people who will argue about who the author of Hebrews was. My, my favorite idea is that it was Luke that was writing down what Paul was dictating to him, and the two of them coupled together. But anyway, these were all commended for their faith, talking about all those who lived by faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. So this is post-resurrection, right? And, and the promise had still not been delivered. It was a future thing. And Paul already talked about Jesus would come in a, as a future event. It's still future for us. Since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Well, I want to tell you this. God has such a spectacular display in mind. He is going to be doing shock and awe in a way that you never could imagine. Even those of us who are prepared with the ancient words that have been shared with us cannot begin to understand and imagine how spectacular this event will be. It's going to be so spectacular that God has, has taken away the consciousness of all those who have preceded us in death and are asleep so that only together we all see it at the same time. You know, and imagine those, those spouses that have been separated from their loved ones because they've gone to sleep and they get to see it together. I, imagine centuries and centuries of your, of your family line and and you recognize everyone and you're seeing this all at the same time as a community because God builds community right well think about a community of of eons of time coming together for the most spectacular event of all eternity Jesus coming back to get all of his people at the same time and I love that because those who have fallen asleep trusting God, they don't know whether it's been a 1,000 years or 10,000 years, and they're certainly not looking down and seeing the suffering and the terrible things that are happening. They are oblivious to all this because there's no consciousness. What a humane and loving thing that God would do that, that after a life of difficulties and struggles, joys and sorrows, that after that life, the next thing you see is Jesus. And you're seeing it together with everyone. I mean, isn't that an awesome God? Doesn't he have a great way of doing this? I remember when I was a little boy before my dad died. Christmas in our house was an incredible event. You know, the only, they did it the German way. And all they did was set up a Christmas tree. It wasn't decorated. No presents. The house wasn't decorated. And my parents would stay up half the night decorating the tree, getting everything ready, putting the presents under the tree, putting decorations around the house. I think they probably went to bed about four in the morning, and we were up at five. <laughs> you know, and, and we were always given the same instructions, don't go downstairs until your father's up. So I'd go, I'd be the, I was the oldest, I was the, you know, knock on the door, you know, my mother would answer, my dad would be snoring, and, and uh, she'd say, okay, okay, uh, okay, <laughs> wait, wait till your dad's up, so he gets up, he goes downstairs, we see Christmas lights coming through the doorway, so we're standing on the landing, we start to hear music playing, and then dad says, okay, boys, and we'd run down the stairs, and as soon as we'd bust through that doorway, a flash, because he took a picture of that event. You know, I think that's just a little hint of what it's going to be like when Jesus comes to take his children home. You know? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, Paul shares this. He says, I declare, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, there it is again, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, imperishable, 
and we will all be changed. For the perishable must put on in the imperishable, must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. Verse 54. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Mm. Mm -mm. I mean, think about that. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, I am looking forward to a brand new body. This one's kind of wearing out, you know? And, and uh, it, it's going to be durable. I mean, it's got a durability guarantee for eternity. I mean, that's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, there's a mystery in this life that, that we, don't, we, we stop regenerating cells, and we're in a downhill slide. But, but God is going to give us living bodies, physical bodies like his body, the Scripture tells us, that, that will last for eternity. And we are all going to see this. We are going to be in this thing in, in, a, in a total reality that will seem like beyond mind-boggling. Oh, you know, here's the big payoff. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down, out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. My dear friends, you know, I look at the wonder of God's love and how he has been preparing through the centuries to offer to us the greatest gift, the fulfillment that the Holy Spirit is already placing within us. Now, one, of the, one last thing that I was wondering about was, well, what about if, I, if I'm decomposed in a grave? And, I mean, what, what about who I am? But see, it says that the spirit, that the breath that God gave us returns to him. Our character is preserved. And he puts it into a brand new body. Because he loves our individuality, he gave it to us. And he is doing an act of recreation in us even as we speak. Yeah. And it won't go on a millisecond longer than it has to as far as waiting because no, more, no one is more eager to put an end to the craziness of this world than God, our loving Father. And that's good news. Amen. I uh, invite you, just reminding you that um, I'm All In takes place in the education wing after the service, we're going to be t looking for the way God wants to lead us in these coming days. Um, and I'm, I'm just so excited. So if you're able to stay, um, we, we welcome you to be there for that. And um, so, Vera, this box, right? What is the greatest gift that we can give to Jesus? It's ourselves. And so as we prepare to leave this place, Lord... We give you an offering of ourselves. We trust you. Even, even with that time when we may breathe our last, we trust you. We give you ourselves. Amen. We trust you with our experiences, with our moments, because you are faithful. And Lord, we look forward to that day when you will say it is done and you come and take your children home. Amen. Until then, Lord, accept our offering. We give it to you as a, as a demonstration of the power of your love working in us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful day, everyone.